Welcome to City Lights. It is the appointed hour. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, readers. Thank you all for coming out on a kind of a messy, messy night um, for a, a joyful but also a sad occasion. Um, I think we're all missing Kay Byer. I know here at City Lights. Um, I was telling Michael and Ian earlier, I think, for years, City Lights uh, put a road on, we got a lot of credibility from, from Kay's association with this bookstore, <laughs> and are, are so, so grateful to her. Um, and um, she had pretty much put the finishing touches on uh, this collection when she died two years ago. Um, it did, did need a little more work, and I think Jim and Richard put the finishing touches on it, and I'm going to let Richard tell you more about that. But uh, real first, uh, real quick, if you do have a phone on you, if you would silence that. <coughs> and uh, I should do the same. <coughs> yeah, Avram uh, is recording this from upstream TV. we will post a link. He'll get it to us next week. So thank you, Avram, for recording. And I think uh, Richard, among other things, Richard's going to tell us a little bit about what this book is going to do for um, Canary Coalition and uh, another local group. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to blather on for a little bit, mm -hmm. and then people up here are just going to read Kay's poems in a flow without anecdotes or stories. Just read the poems to mm -hmm. get a sense of the poems. They will be as they appear in relative order in the book. Um, someone had asked, thought I should explain a little bit about JCAR Press. My press is JCAR Press, we're a community active press. What that means is when we started, we realized you're not going to make any money selling poetry anyway, so why bother trying? Um, all, all our proceeds, we're not a nonprofit, we do not have university support, but all our proceeds go into both publishing, there's a range of our books over there, and um, pro uh, supporting progressive organizations and causes that we think are working for uh, effective change in their communities. On our website, there's a whole list of over two dozen places that we've made direct donations to. Most recently, we've uh, supported the Boston Immigration Justice Accompany Network, uh, something that I'm a little bit familiar with, where they literally take immigrants step by step and walk them through the whole process. So they have someone with them all, every step of the way, which makes a much more successful program. We've also uh, been long-term supporters of the Women's Theater Festival and the Triangle, which uh, is the first festival of its kind in this state and one of the only few in the country that uh, focuses on uh, plays that are written, directed, and acted by women. Um, first Nations Development Institute is another recent one. What they do is they're giving grants out to other tribal organizations to do dual language. Um, training so that the, the 150 native languages don't get lost, and Edwin's House, which is uh, something I'm particularly fond of. They're an organization out of Cleveland, started by an ex-prisoner, and what they do is they run a gourmet French restaurant, and they hire only people who have been in prison, and they train them in every step. So the sous chefs, the sommelier, the cheese board people, the wait staff, uh, the business people, they're all uh, ex-prisoners, and the recidivism rate is something like 1.5%. So it's, uh, those are the types of organizations, come on in, come on in, organizations that we support. We also do direct service workshops. We do workshops with women in prison, coming out of prison, transitioning out in Raleigh in a program called Job Start, using poetry as uh, to help people develop the higher order thinking skills they need to transition. We've offered uh, free workshops in the past year to women who are survivors of sexual assault. Um, at our community work, we bring other writers into the state. We run a gathering of poets, which was uh, we we found it with another press years ago. Um, initially, that that ultimately did not work <coughs> out collaboratively because you've got an activist, leftist press, and a conservative Republican press, and it just didn't mesh. Um, but uh, we're, we're glad to start that. We've continued that. And we bring writers like Lee Young Lee, Marilyn Nelson, who just got the Booth Lilly Award, Lifetime Achievement, 
into the state. Next year we're bringing in Ilya Kaminsky um, as one of our featured writers. And we brought in people like Pulitzer Prize winner Steve Dunn, Jackson Prize winner Patricia Spears Jones. Underwrite the cost of that because we think it's important to bring poetic voices to the state who writers otherwise would not hear. Although it's out of the state. We had someone travel 10,000 miles from Singapore last year to come to the Lee Young Lee workshop. He will be, if you're in the triangle in October, we are bringing back Lee Young Lee to work with David Whetstone. We're going to be presenting uh, performances called Speaking with the Universe. One's going to be October 25th in Durham and one's October 26th in Greensboro. So you can always just email me. There are cards over there. Um, we, every year we have a Julie Soup Award. Uh, we think Julie is one of the undervalued writers in the state. And what the award is for another press, a $500 award to another press for the best book by an independent, non-commercial press in this country. And we think it's a great way to create support for other small presses. Um, we also hire people that we've worked with. Our social media is now being run by a woman, June Suber, who I first met in jobs that when she was still in prison. And she is running our entire social media program now. She reads, she's not a poet, but she's a smart, sensitive, creative person. She reads books, she chooses the quotes, she schedules the tweets, she handles all that. And we're also going to be working her into um, doing some made graphic, graphic design. We also have hired recently a, a young self-defined queer woman from uh, Salem <coughs> Women's College and she's working as an assistant editor, working directly with, she has several writers she's assigned with to take them through that process from proofreading to publication because we think that stuff is important. <coughs> Our printer is 100% uh, sustainable. Um, so, and, and that's good too. We also pay designer. We pay a designer. We do not use templates. Um, the sales of case books, proceeds from the sales are going to go to two organizations that support things that we thought were important to her, the Canary Coalition, um, which in addition to running a TV station also does a lot of legislative focus, and also the Watershed Association of the Tuskegee River. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, and you can talk to those gentlemen later and they can tell you about what they do. We could talk about how the book came about, but maybe that'll be better for after the reading. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead now, we'll do the reading. If you have any questions or comments afterwards, we can take those, or people can tell stories, anecdotes about Kay, and we can talk about specifically about how this book came about. So we're going to begin with Jeanette. That's for Yahweh. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Do you want me to stand up? Or? Whatever's comfortable for you. Her Road. She knew nothing more waited for her at the end of the road. She had everything she needed right here. The legions of corn standing guard at her windows. The lantana yielding its harvest of grasshoppers. White leggards building their temples of chicken shit under the porch. At the end of the road lay another road, rutted and muddy in rain. In drought season, thirsty and treacherous. After that, what? This is it, she declared to the preacher who urged her to look toward the fields of the hereafter. No change of seasons there. No pig slops, no cow turds, no yard to sweep every day. Only light, always light. Thus she labored toward night when her broody flocks settled into the peace of their straw comforts. Somnolent hounds snored. The silence of kitchen that signified she had no place else to go now but bed. Bless me, cornfields, for I have laid down unto night all I am, so much body that I make the four-poster creek. Listen, the crows wake up early, claiming the day with their black wings and hungry beaks. Dare you walk out to claim your own morning? Shield the sunflower sprouts from their pillage? 
What in the garden is yours? What in the forest? If only, you say, you could pitch your tent amid green shoots and blue shadows, renounce the roots holding you fast. Why do you let the crows taunt you? Throw down your toothbrush, let fall your nightgown, and walk out the back door. The grass blades will never again feel so wetted, the earth underfoot so forgiving. This one is uh, to Terophila camelifolia. That's the Katie did uh, at the uh, winter solstice. In the silence of solstice dark, while smoke from forest fires kindled by long drought and arsonist still shrouds our valley, you bide your time inside your cradles of poplar and hickory. On our ridge tonight, you are safe to slumber toward equinox. Your kin, burned to ash along Dick's Gap, lie dreamless on forest floors or born who knows where on the wind. If you dream about anything, my small nestling neighbors, may it be green through which sunlight, unfurling its lifeline, awakens you, calling you forth to devour every leaf bite of chlorophyll, the whole budding forest a feast for you. Bon appetit, little soon-to-be troubadours. How else emerge into the choristers' late summer rouses, nocturnal tree dwellers whose mouths must all keep all summer long masticating, your leaf wings beginning to tune up come twilight, strumming in pure anapestic desire. Get it on, get it on. <laughs> <laughs> Roaming the canopy, how can the females resist your seductions, you rock stars of late summer? <laughs> Maybe come August, I'll dare the devil himself to come down to Cullowee Valley and challenge you. Maybe I'll dare every tuxedoed fiddler in New York and Paris to match your wings, strumming a mere 300 times every second. Now, in the silence of solstice dark, I lie in bed, sleepless with longing for your no-holds-barred, wing-fiddling rapture, the forest around me throbbing again with your passion. We're on page 26 if you're following along. Three, for my trail guide, for Jim. One, Scent. Before I can catch my breath, you right away start to identify wild ginger, mayapple, bloodroot. I'm dizzy <coughs> with switchbacks I see rising into the hardwoods you hail, sarvis, sycamore, tulip tree. Trillium sweeps down the hillside like angel wings come to rest creekside. <coughs> you chanting hepatica, stonecrop, anemone. We climb until we reach the summit, where, underfoot, some stubborn lichen you can't name has already claimed the best view. <coughs> Two, stargrass. You name it, and there it is, at the edge of the outcropping over the gorge. Not to worry, I placate the ravens that harry us. We won't be lingering long in your airy. See? Even now, we are striding away into star grass, its small spikes of clear, recognizable light. Three. Galax. Squatting behind bushes, I smell it nearby. Neither bear scat nor carrion vine, to which naturalists liken its scent, but the breath of an old woman lowering herself to her chamber pot, <coughs> sighing as I heard her sigh while I tried not to listen. Hoisting my backpack, I leave her behind in the underbrush, glad to be back on the trail with you, sidestepping tree stump and blowdown, splashing through creek bed, 
striding from switchback to switchback towards sky we see step by step open its window when almost to summit I stop breathing hard the scent of her following Not at home, Hambridge Center for the Creative Arts. This cabin is too clean, too uncluttered. No mail order catalogs, no post-its stuck to the walls saying do this and do that. No oak tree beginning to green up its old limbs. Beneath it, my old dog whose arthritis stays him from squirrel chasing. If I were home, I'd hear frat houses pumping hard rock through the valley. I twist in my earplugs, fight back with Beethoven. I'd stand at my sink, watching pines bending slowly as yoga instructors. I'd lift my arms to the ceiling and lean to the left, to the right, while the five o'clock news filled my kitchen with loss crashing down around people at home or like me not at home minding our own business Di <coughs> excuse me diagnostic and this opens with a brief quote from KK Darawala from his poem night fishing which reads alone is the mind before the dreams crowd in. One, she does not know, she says, while staring at Arctic peaks framed just beyond his chair. The doctor nods, his pencil digs into each square of no, a line of no's descending till the final one. Where do you live? She stares at frozen wastes. She nods, she knows. Count it two. Counting backwards, seven steps she goes, till up against a wall, she stops and feels the numbers bunch like briars in her mind. She never could do numbers. This times this, divided by infinity. Now what's left? This answer is easy. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Three. The day? The month and year. Her maiden name, the name of president whose face speaks war to her from TV screen at night before she swallows one white pill and sleeps. The last she heard from him, he spoke of faith to win the fields of Europe where her husband waits. Four. Right, the doctor says. She does. Trembling words for air and water, blue of sky. The pencil in her hand reminds her how the point might break, the teacher looking down, and all around her children laughing while she tries to make the broken shaft of lead work right. Study in red with lipstick for an eye. If I had unbuttoned your blouse as you lay in your coffin, I could have seen how the tumor that killed you had grown overnight into merely benign. I marveled instead at your lips, the red kept with improper borders, the first time in how many years? <coughs> Whoever applied it acknowledged the edges that blur in a woman your age. The edge between living and dying began to blur weeks before you wandered over the finish line. No celebration, except for that party girl red on your lips, no doubt chosen to match the coy flowers that bloomed on your silk blouse. Now I want to name it a shade that says more than mere red, which end rhymes too quickly with dead, the quick of which I'm still a part, and you dead, which I cannot accept. <coughs> better dead than red, I grew up hearing Patriots bluster, but came to prefer better red than dead, and now, give me better than red. Give me raising hell red. 
better yet, everlastingly red. To the last trumpet blares and you wake up, moving your lips, as if to ask, how do I look? Do I need rouge? More lipstick? So long in the grave, the voice shrivels to wind down a drain pipe. I open my palm sack and lift out the golden tube wherein a scarlet nib waits to inscribe on your lips a shade conjured from sheer disbelief and infused with no more than the balm of a name. Neither hope nor hereafter, but this gleam of wide awake red. Come evening. <clears throat> Come evening, the earth lifts her spirits. Breathe from the odors of gasoline, motor oil, sweat, and the inexorable coil of exhaust from the highway beyond her breath's provenance. She breathes forth the truth of her burial grounds where her potsherds have waited for lifetimes to be found, her snake skins, the bones of her numerous deer slain, the bloodbath of hogs. I, her daughter, watched butcher each fall from the safety of that porch. Her veins, varicose as my grandmother's, pulsate with origins, season by season becoming the wild native yeast of her landscape, its kneading of weather and soil bringing increase or famine. Come evening, I stand on my uh, come evening, I stand on my side of the barbed wire, inhaling her risings. My hands, lately lifted from oats, I tossed into the cattle trough. Hands I raise up with her dirt their lifelines. The dusk deepens. Startle of crickets around me. The farthest cow lows. The morning dove silences drawing me closer. A woman's voice calling, don't tarry too long. Now her kitchen light kindles. The gone faces waiting around her spread table, the glow of her fire in the hearth. <laughs> Did anybody here want to say anything? was my teacher and beloved friend for a long, long time, and we were traveling companions. I called myself her camp follower, um, and there were just so many times. Um, AWP in Kansas City was the first time we traveled together, <clears throat> but I went to Raleigh when she was inducted into the North Carolina, what is it, Hard Hall of Fame? Literary Hall of Fame. Literary Hall of Fame. And, um, and then, of course, the poet laureate. Um, event and um, the crowning with kudzu, as Michael would say, and um, and just again and again watched her um, her impact on uh, on the students, on the people she encountered. She was, I would say, I would say the most loyal person I've ever known. She just, when she cared, and, and especially if you were her student and friend, uh, just she was going to be, she was going to have your back no matter what. And she was going to do everything in her power to encourage you to believe in yourself. And, um, and she was a master teacher. Um, we, first, we first met each other in a master class of hers at Brass Town. And um, she had a whole library set up for us. And we got snowed in, which was kind of better than can even imagine. <laughs> um, but it was just, she was just a, a complete inspiration for so many people. And I watched her with people who, you know, 
people who were beginners, people who were gifted, people who, you know, um, she just was a passionate defender of people and of truth. Would you mind telling us your name? Please? Susan Leffler. But why, why doesn't everybody just go around and speak their name? Jeanette Cabin Spruan. He was my teacher too, and I just want to add to what Susan said about her ability to, um, you know, sometimes when you're in a workshop, you know, you, you confront the next poem and you look at it and go, oh heaven, you know, what am I going to say about this? And then Kay would find, she could find beauty and worth in whatever, whatever level someone was working on and whatever they had presented. It was just really phenomenal to see how she did, how she brought out the best uh, of everyone um, that way. She was quite dramatic. I never traveled anywhere with Kay, but um, she used to come over to my house in April and uh, drink wine with me under the plum trees when they were blooming. Um, and uh, just those long rambling conversations uh, in the fragrance of the plum blossoms. That's how I'm, that's how I'm going to remember her. And, and every year when plums come back, um, it feels like she's around. Uh, Catherine Carter. Joshua Lavender. Pat Revere Steele. Michael Redman. Richard Crow. And I'm Jim. <laughs> um, I want to follow up on what Susan and Jeanette was saying. I think one of the things that gets overlooked about Kay's legacy is the way she was the first woman poet laureate in North Carolina. And she totally changed what it meant to be a poet laureate. Prior to that, Fred Chappell was the one who, who um, had the position before her, and the poet laureate in the state was just basically someone who was like a, an esteemed figure and would go to special events. Um, and Kay set up a website, my Lawrence Lasso, where she published probably everybody in the state who had ever written a poem, it seemed. You know, I, it was like she wrote in as many people as she could and gave them attention and really brought the laureateship into the public. And that, you know, with, with few exceptions, has changed the way the Poet Laureate has worked in this state and has made it much more of an activist position than it ever was before. I had the good fortune to work with her um, as a friend and as a publisher. I first published her when she was an unknown girl in the mountains back in an anthology in 83, I think it was called Cardinal. Um, and then the first book that actually came through K through J. Guy Press, was not her book, it was all beautiful book by John Thomas York. It was an essay about the value of the arts and education. And then Kay had brought it to my attention. It was the time when the Republican legislature was trying to cut funding for the arts. And so Jake R. Press went ahead and did a, uh, a limited run production of this. And I literally went down to the legislature building, the legislative building, and passed out to every single person there who was elected a copy of this book and asked them to read it before they voted on the budget. I don't know if they did, uh, <laughs> but at least we did that. Yes. Um, then, then we were fortunate enough to publish um, her chapbook, The Vision of Bird, which is kind of like a memorial and also an, an affirmation uh, of a friend's life, and Southern Fictions, which was, we, we do some high-end art collectible books. And this was a book we did in collaboration with Post and Buggy Press. It was hand letter press and we had handmade paper covers. Um, being the businessman that I am, I forgot to bring a copy. <laughs> you know, but um, we still have a couple left. But this was uh, a collectible book in land that sold. It cost us $70, I think it was, to produce each copy, you know, and sold for 100 But it was something that we felt was really important. It, there were sonnets about what she witnessed as a child growing up around the theme of race and racial injustice. And then, of course, this book. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how this book came about. I will. I will. Uh, for one thing, I can illustrate with this book uh, just how very 
carefully she worked at putting a book together. Uh, this existed in four uh, separate and distinct versions on her computer, uh, and I think there were a couple of printed uh, versions as well. And this is the fourth version, as you would expect. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how much thought she put into the organization, uh, there is a poem entitled Easter included in this book. Uh, it's a sestina, and it's uh, very carefully written. Uh, it was part of a sequence uh, that included Lent, and uh, Good Friday, and I think there was another one, a sequence uh, of which it was a part in version number one, and that may have lasted until version number two. Uh, in version number four, she had removed uh, all of the poems in the sequence except for Easter. Uh, and had placed it where it is in book, uh, which meant, I suspect, that she was sort of sacrificing several good poems that would become of, of, less, uh, of less something, less value, I suppose, if they're removed, if they're not concluded by Easter. Uh, but the reason, I think, was that uh, they were lighter poems. Lent was certainly a lighter poem because in it she had uh, some friends of hers talking about all of the things that they were giving up for Lent. Uh, uh, French wine, French kisses, I forget what all they were talking about, but a much lighter poem. Uh, Easter, uh, when you read it, you will realize that it's not at all a lighter poem that actually fits in very well with the, uh, with the uh, seriousness of that last section. And I think that's clearly what she had in mind by tossing out uh, several poems for the sake of Easter alone. Uh, so she worked very, very carefully and uh, painstakingly in putting a book like this together, uh, and uh, just any old order would, would never do. Uh, Richard and I did have uh, a little bit to work on with it, um, uh, but uh, essentially with just one or two uh, uh, changes, essentially this is the, the way it was. Um, we really did not do much editing at all to it. But we should give a shout out to David Hopes because uh, we spent an afternoon in Asheville at David's studio, his generous gifts. We literally laid all the poems out and went over them poem by poem, sequencing, you know, uh, some minor editing, this and that, and um, about four hours or something. You know, trying to, you know, it, when someone has passed, you obviously want to honor it. But also as an editor, from my perspective, I also honor that by also treating it as I would anybody's manuscript. I've been fortunate to have uh, worked as an editor with very good poets, Dorian Lux. I edited Betty Adcock and survived. You know, um, <laughs> actually, actually that ended up being pretty good. So, so, and I had worked with Kay before, and we'd gone back and forth on poems, and obviously, you know, Jim was familiar with her work, too, so I, I felt that we both had really strong understanding of what, there were a couple places that would she have said this, or would she have kept this line in, and we, we tried to really think through as much as we could without really altering it. I did want to just point out the cover, too. The cover is by um, a friend of hers, Elizabeth Ellison. And it actually is a longer painting. This is the top of the painting. Um, I'm fortunate that my son's a designer. He went to UNC Asheville, actually, where he got an excellent education. Studied with a guy who had been lead animator for Disney for 10 years. 
then when it fit his masters at Elon, we thought it sucked compared to actual. <laughs> you know, but um, what he did, given the theme and the poems, he took the tops, the top of the painting, and moved it to the back. So you have this sort of like this ethereal <coughs> movement going upwards, and he's he did some motion activity with the text, as you can see, the trolling, the silence is sort of receding, it's behind some of the trees, but her name is like still on the front, still on the top. So it wasn't just, let's throw some text on a, a painting. The, the whole thing was designed to try to respect a painter, the cave very widely admired, and also the contents of the book too. Does anybody here have something they'd like to say about K poetry? Well, um, I'd like to say something. Okay. Um, I think of all the people sitting up here, I probably knew K the shortest period of time. Um, I think I got to know, I first got to know her on social media, on Facebook. I think that was about 2011 or 2012. Um, seems to me it was because I was uh, newly arrived uh, at the University of Maryland and I was doing an MFA and I was reaching out to various poets that interested me trying to strike up correspondences. Kay was the only person I managed to strike <laughs> up a correspondence <laughs> with. But uh, that's telling. One thing I got to benefit from really as I got to know her was um, just what an interest she took in other writers and in fostering them. Um, she certainly took an interest in me that even my professors at Maryland did not take. Um, after I was done with grad school, um, I met her in person for the first and only time at one of Jay Carr's uh, gathering of poets in Winston-Salem. And after that, um, after that, uh, Kay asked to see, I had a, of course, having done an MFA, I had a thesis, and I was working on turning that into a full collection. She asked to see it. So she saw it, and then she said, get in touch with my old editor at Louisiana State University Press, which is where most of her really, you know, meaty collections came out from. Um, and uh, just tell him that I said to send your book out there. Well, I sent it to LSU. And uh, that editor, I think it was John <coughs> Easterly, had already uh, moved on to another part of the press. The editor who's still there, uh, Mary Catherine Calloway, just passed along my book on Kay's recommendation to one of their series editors, who then declined it. <laughs> but this was extraordinary for me. It was not the sort, it was the sort of thing that I really hoped one or two of my professors at Maryland would have done, would have introduced me to an editor, or, um, you know, passed along my manuscript on recommendation to at least get it a hearing. And I'm very grateful that she did that. <coughs> One little sign uh, for me of Kay's generosity that people have mentioned, and it's something that I, uh, I, I have taken that that leaf out of the book. I always do this myself now. Is that whenever she would have a reading, she would begin by reading a poem by somebody else. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. yes. I loved that about yes. Kay. That was just okay. so telling. I always try to do that. Your reading. initial comment gave me a quite an insight into her. Uh, I'm more of a musician than a poet, and Charlie Parker has always been an idol of mine. And, uh, I know a lot of stories about him. And the band was on a break one night, so he and all of his guys are standing in the back of the club, 
And there was a guy playing alto sax up there that was just doing an execrable job of his solo. And the band's just sitting there laughing at each other like, God, how bad is that guy in verses? They said, Bird. I said, my God, that guy's awful. He said, yeah, but I know what the cat's trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when you said that, I think somebody with that much insight into everything right. could pick up something in somebody that's maybe not quite that good. Well, another thing was <clears throat> in the Poet Laureate, we had a, a brief little turmoil a few mm. years ago mm. when it was well and truly politicized by clueless people in the state. And what was so interesting was, as passionate as Kay was, and I'm confident is, as we speak, uh -huh. um, she was she could distinguish between a, a really clueless, cynical, manipulative political <coughs> process and the person who was caught up in it. Mm -hmm. And she she absolutely never missed a beat in trying to reach out to that woman who had been put in that position. Based, I mean, she said yes to it, but you know, she, it was clear that she was out of her league and had no idea what was going to get unleashed. And Kay was absolutely supportive and made so clear that there had to be a distinction between the person and all of the unpleasant surroundings. Um, and I, that, that said volumes to me about <coughs> my friend. It didn't surprise me, but it was certainly a confirmation. I want to say thank you, Susan, for wearing the black shawl. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you and I went, why did I wear mine? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Kay, Kay took weaving classes for me 35 years ago, I guess. And um, uh, she subsequently wrote uh, uh, a, a couple of pieces that involved the textile construction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was such a joy to have her uh, take a, a good look at that. Yeah, process. she was a real spokesman for those of us up here in the mountains as that poem began. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, down in some independent bookstores, not City Lights, a couple of months ago, and I was sorry to find that they did not have case books. Uh, when people die and cannot advocate for themselves anymore, it is often easy to forget them, especially with a literary establishment who thinks they know what the work is, and maybe they do not. Should you all happen to walk into an independent bookstore, or a dependent bookstore, or a corporate <laughs> bookstore, I would really encourage you to ask them to carry Kay's work and not let the work vanish. That, that, is, a, that is a big problem. Uh, as I mentioned, JCOM Press, we have an annual contest for other literary presses. And this year, we added another component, because there were two books published by writers who had passed on. When, um, I think it was called The Vita by Monica Hand, which Alice James books published, which is one of my favorite uh, publishers in the world. And um, the other was um, a book of translation by Jose Cardona, by her da his daughter, Helene Cardona, published by Salmon Press. When this book uh, was printed, I contacted every independent bookstore in North Carolina and ask them about carrying. Of course, City Lights immediately, yes, you know. And so far, I've only heard from one other bookstore. That's it. Mm -hmm. Not even Malaprops mm -hmm. responded. So, so everywhere we go, we should say, what? You don't have trawling I'm silences? <laughs> it is, it is, I think that there's a bigger problem here that nobody's really paying too much attention to, and that's the domination of Ingram. Ingram is, you know, people complain about Amazon or Walmart. Ingram has a stranglehold on book distribution in this country. You go to Europe and they have something called One Portal, where a bookstore just orders a book and there's like a dozen or so different distributors and they get to whichever one's closest. Uh, Ingram is preventing that from happening in this country. Ingram is basically preventing independent bookstores from ordering books 
that I have in the uh, Ingram database. And it's now extended to the public library. We published the last two books by Jackie Shelton Green, the first African-American poet laureate in North Carolina. I personally went to three different library systems. They said, we're not allowed to order that book by Ingram because we signed a contract with Ingram mm -hmm. that in order to get their discount, mm -hmm. we can't order, the public library cannot order outside of the Ingram database. So if it's not in their database, it's it really does not. Not only that, really that I saw when I was looking at, looking at Malaprops, Malaprops has carried out books. I saw one of our books was listed out of print and not likely to become available. And I called over there, Monk, I said, what's going on here? This book, you just got this book from us not too long ago. So the default now is that it's not in the database to say it's not possible to get it. What about North Carolina collections and libraries? North Carolina collections, well, this is what's ironic. North Carolina collections, if you can get them directly, they would usually order it. And the library system can actually order through Amazon if someone requests it. Well, we just come to City Lights. The right, City Lights. I, I'm, I'm a long, <laughs> I'm a long time supporter of independent <laughs> bookstores, and I think you should support independent bookstores. But as a publisher, I need to be on Amazon. Because that's you do not have independent bookstores in poor black neighborhoods. We sold enough copies of Resisting Arrest. All the money from that, that sales went to fund scholarships for two young African-American women, one at D.C. and one at Emory. 80% of our sales came through Amazon. So I was not supposed to give these women the scholarship. You know, as you can see, City Lights carries it, you know. So it's important to support the independent bookstores, but it's also important at the same time to try to advocate against Ingram's stranglehold on the distribution system, because they have put a lot of really good distributors out of business. So they're, they're one big competitor they had just fell just out, of the, out of the bookstore business. Baker and Taylor, yeah. Baker and Taylor, we knew they were like going to fade for a couple of years. So that's it. So it's basically it's Ingram or nothing. And that, of course, hurts independent writers. It hurts independent presses. So go to the independent bookstores, but also go to the libraries. You know, um, libraries are great for presses because they pay full price. Right? Perhaps a library would accept a gift. I bought one for us already. Well, no, we I'm, I'm there are <laughs> other libraries. Yes, maybe, yes. maybe they would all right. like I'm going to email all of our libraries. Right. Yeah. We try to um, actually donate some of Jackie's books to some Durham libraries. Said, no, we, we got poetry books six years ago. We're not buying, we don't want any more for our collection. They have a number that they're allowed to have on the shelves. <laughs> yeah. Can I also just remind people that Kay left all of her poetry books to the library, so we have oh, that's great. hundreds of her books up at the library. If you ever want to come and see them, they're always oh, that's nice. downstairs. Mm. That's great. Hey, that's great. Uh, I actually have a question for Jim. Um, so uh, about a month and a half or two months, somewhere in there, before Kay passed away, she sent me an email. She talked about this book in passing, and she also talked about a book of essays that mm -hmm. she was working on. She said that she had essays that she had written going way back that she wanted to collect them. And I wondered if that, where that manuscript might be. In well, unfortunately, it's not a manuscript yet. Um, yeah, she. Um, has uh, a lot of essays in a number of different places, in pictures, uh, uh, et cetera. And she did indeed want to uh, have them collected. And sooner or later, I would like to see that done. She also had at least uh, uh, material for another collection of poetry that she was working on. Uh, uh, she had several, well, two. No, three. Three uh, lengthy sequences, one of which uh, uh, appeared in the North Carolina Literary Review uh, a couple of years ago. Another one that appeared in uh, the Asheville Poetry Review. And then one that she was working on, which wasn't published yet. She, she mentioned uh, 
a, a book called, I think she was calling it Black Work, which is about embroidery, mm -hmm. and it was uh, also a name for undertaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, she had, uh, on her computer, she had uh, a small uh, collection of poems uh, under the overall title of Black Work, and a title poem that was called Black Work as well, that dealt with, that dealt with the uh, uh, embalming that her grandmother had done, and, and uh, the sequence related to that that uh, was called The Searcher, and it dealt with uh, uh, it dealt with um, uh, a practice in the past of uh, guaranteeing that, as I understood it, that corpses were embalmed in the world, uh, sort of a complicated thing. And uh, one of the most interesting poems that she ever wrote, I don't know, some of you might have seen it, called Her Messengers, but, uh, but she had uh, this black work uh, I can't call it volume. It, it was about mm, 25 poems, I would say. 20 to 25. A chapbook. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it was a chapbook. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there, uh, there is a good bit of editing yet to be done. Okay. I'm very glad to hear that things haven't gone missing or anything mm. that y'all kept track of where no, things were. They're, they're, they're there. They're there. What you should publish is her letters. <laughs> her letters to the editor, yeah. especially. <laughs> I was thinking her letters to the writing community. Yeah. <laughs> that would be. That was a creative story. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank you for City Lights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And books. Did you take a look at the